Taylor Swift. You know her name. She has built an extraordinary career, a business empire. What actually prompted me to go down the rabbit hole and to research her and understand exactly what she's built was a stat that I found that I think you'll enjoy. One in every $25 spent in the music industry can be attributed to Taylor Swift. This stat, honestly, is such an absurd achievement. That kind of metric can really not be seen in any other industry. So I'm very excited to get into it. Before we start, I researched for several hours before I put this together. I drew from a variety of sources. So hopefully this brings a very comprehensive, insightful analysis into her life, but also the business that she's built and some of the strategies that she's used to build this behemoth of a brand. I've looked at some interviews that she's given to Rolling Stone and Billboard and Variety. There's two books that I read through, so Taylor Swift, Life, Super Fans, and Everything in Between, as well as Taylor Swift, The Whole Story. Obviously, several YouTube videos, you can see them all linked below. I've also looked at some financial reports from Forbes, Bloomberg, and WSJ. I've seen some of the stuff that she's put out, some of the communication that she's had with her fans, as well as some music reports from RIAA and NMPA. But I didn't really stop there to really understand the Taylor Swift phenomenon, I've really gone and looked beyond just her and just even the music industry. So there's some interesting comparisons with other industries and other business models that really provides you some context and some insights. And hopefully by the end of this, you will get a 360 degree view of how Taylor Swift built her empire. So things that I'm going to cover today, Taylor's early years and her break into country music, her transition from country to pop, how she managed this very relatively risky move, some of the business strategies behind her album releases, tours, merchandise, her battles with streaming services and record labels and how these really shaped the industry, the re-recording of her early albums and the business strategy behind this move, her impact on the broader music industry and artists' rights, the creation and management of her personal brand, her approach to fan engagement and community building, the economic impact of her tours and releases, and some lessons that we can learn from her career and her life that can really apply to any industry or any business. And throughout the podcast, I want to draw parallels between her strategies and those used in other industry. So it'll start to make sense. I'll unpack some of the numbers behind our success. And of course, I want to extract the key business and life lessons that are really going to take your business to the next level, things you can learn from Taylor Swift. So this podcast is for anybody who's a diehard Swifty, a business enthusiast, or just somebody who's interested in how modern celebrity empires are built. So let's jump into it. This is Taylor Swift's success story. So let's start at the beginning. Taylor Allison Swift was born on December 13th, 1989 in Reading, Pennsylvania. But here's something you may not know. Her name wasn't chosen just because her parents liked it. In an interview with American Songwriter, she actually revealed to quote, my mom named me Taylor because she thought it would help me in business. She wanted to give me a gender neutral name. So if I wanted to be a businesswoman and I had my resume out there, they wouldn't know if I was a boy or a girl. Now, little did Andrea Swift know that her daughter would indeed become a businesswoman, but in a field far different than what she initially had imagined. Now, Taylor grew up on a Christmas tree farm in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. This period of her life, obviously this was pre-music, she started to show her true passion for musical theater when she was around nine years old. But even before she was nine, this period of her life had a massive impact on her. She's even written a song called Christmas Tree Farm, and she's referenced this period of her life and her upbringing and her rural roots in a lot of her work. Now, like I said, around nine years old, this is when she fell in love with musical theater. She started performing in local productions. And for most kids, this would just be a fun hobby. But for Taylor, she really saw it as career training. By 11, she was starting to make regular trips to Nashville with her family. So I want you to picture this. A preteen Taylor demo CD in hand, marching up and down Music Row, knocking on every label's doors. And in her own words, she said, I would go up and down Music Row, knocking on doors, handing out my demo. I'd say, hi, I'm Taylor. I'm 11. I want a record deal. Call me. Now, did this bold move land her a record deal? No, but it did something arguably more valuable. It got her noticed. In an industry that is built on relationships, Taylor was starting to lay the groundwork for her future success. Now, at 12, Taylor picked up a guitar and started writing her own songs. First, Lucky You. It wasn't about love or heartbreak. It was actually about winning 
a competition in school. Even then, she was channeling her experience into her art, a skill that would become her trademark. And here's where it gets interesting from a business perspective. By 14, Taylor had signed with Sony ATV as their youngest ever songwriter. Think about that. While most kids her age were worrying about school dances, Taylor was negotiating publishing deals. The big break came in 2005 at Nashville's Bluebird Cafe. Scott Brichetta, about to launch Big Machine Records, saw Taylor perform and knew he had to sign her. But here's the kicker. Taylor's dad, Scott Swift, bought a 3% stake in the brand new fledgling label for an estimated $120,000. Now, this, especially for the family at the time, was a huge risk. But that was one that would pay off astronomically. And before we just continue this story, let's put that investment into perspective. Big Machine sold to Scooter Braun's Ithaca Holdings in 2019 for a reported three. Hundred million, So that would make Scott Swift's initial $120,000 investment worth around $9 million. Now, I know that Taylor has made a lot more than $9 million, but talk about a not-so-bad return on investment. But the real story here isn't just about the money. It is truly about a family believing so deeply in their daughter's talent that they were willing to take a significant financial risk. It's about understanding that in the music industry, and like most industries, having skin in the game can be just as important as raw talent. Now, as we move into Taylor's debut era, it's crucial to understand the landscape of the music industry in 2006. The industry was in a state of flux. It was dealing with the digital revolution. CD sales were declining rapidly with a 20% drop in album sales between 2000 and 2006. Digital downloads were on the rise, but the industry was still trying to figure out how to monetize this new format effectively. Piracy was rampant with peer-to-peer file sharing networks like LimeWire and BitTorrent that were causing major headache for record labels. Now, in this volatile environment, launching a new artist was risky business, especially one targeting the country music market, which traditionally skewed older and was slower to adapt to digital trends. But Big Machine Records, remember, a newly formed independent label, they had a secret weapon in Taylor Swift. Her debut single, Tim McGraw, was released on June 19, 2006. The song was co-written by Swift and Liz Rose. It was a nostalgic ballad that showcased Swift's storytelling abilities and her knack for relatable, emotionally resonant lyrics. It peaked at number 40 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 6 on the Hot Country Songs chart, a respectable showing for a debut single from an unknown artist. Now, this is where Taylor's business savvy starts to shine. Instead of relying solely on traditional radio play and music video rotation, she started to leverage, at the time, a then-emerging platform you may know the name, MySpace. Now, this was at a time when most artists were using MySpace as an afterthought. Taylor made it central to her marketing strategy. She personally managed her MySpace page. She responded to every fan comment. She shared behind-the-scenes content from her life and her career. And this first direct-to-fan approach was really revolutionary at the time. Taylor would spend hours each day on the platform, building relationships with her growing fan base. She shared personal stories, early versions of her songs, and she even gave fans a say in her career decisions. For instance, she asked fans to help choose the cover art for a single, Picture to Burn. This level of engagement was un unprecedented and created a sense of intimacy and ownership amongst her fans. Now, by October of 2006, when her self-titled debut album was released, Taylor had built a very loyal online following of over 2 million MySpace friends. This digital army would prove crucial in driving album sales and word-of-mouth promotions. Let's talk numbers. Taylor Swift, the album, debuted at number 19 on the Billboard 200, selling 39,000 copies in its first week. And now, this might seem modest by today's standards. It was a very impressive feat for a debut country album from a 16-year-old unknown artist. But what's truly remarkable is the album's longevity. It spent 275 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, and that's over five years. The album climbed as high as number five on the chart, fueled by the success of its singles and basically Taylor's relentless promotion. The album spawned five singles. So Tim McGraw, Teardrops on My Guitar, Our Song, Picture to Burn, and Should Have Said No. Each single 
performed progressively better on the charts, with our song becoming Taylor's first number one on the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart. This made her the youngest person to single-handedly write and perform a number one song on the chart. As of 2024, Taylor Swift has been certified 7X Platinum by the RIAA, translating to over 7 million units sold in the United States alone. Globally, the album has sold over 10 million copies, and these numbers are staggering for a debut album especially in the country genre. But raw sales and raw sale numbers, they don't tell the whole story. What is truly impressive is how Taylor built her brand and fan base during this period. As her album gained traction, she embarked on a grueling radio tour. We're talking three to four radio stations a day, performing acoustically, charming DJs across the country. This grassroots approach paid off in building relationships with radio programmers and listeners alike. Her work ethic during this period was legendary. She would often perform at multiple venues in a single day, ranging from country fairs to opening slots for established country acts. In 2006 alone, she performed over 200 50 shows. This relentless touring schedule allowed her to build a loyal fan base city by city, state by state. One very smart move was her focus on performing at high schools. So Taylor and her team realized that by performing free concerts at schools, they could reach their target demographic directly and create lifelong fans. These performances often included Q&A sessions, further strengthening Taylor's connection with her young audience. Now, let's talk about Taylor's songwriting. From the beginning, she understood the power of relatability. Songs like Tear drops on my guitar and our song they resonated with teenagers because they felt authentic this wasn't some adult writing about teen experiences this was a peer sharing her life take teardrops on my guitar for instance the song was inspired by taylor's unrequited crush on a classmate named drew perfectly captured the ache of teenage longing lines like he's the reason for teardrops on my guitar and the only thing that keeps me wishing on a wishing star spoke directly to the hearts of young listeners who would experience very similar feelings In 2008, she interviewed with a publication called The Boot, and she said, I think the reason these songs have been so well received is because they're written from a very real place. I'm not trying to be anybody else. I'm just trying to write about what I go through. And this authenticity became Taylor's brand, and it was a goldmine. Teenagers saw themselves in her songs. Parents appreciated her wholesome image, and the country music establishment respected her songwriting chops. And it's actually worth noting that Taylor wrote or co-wrote every song on her debut album. This was rare, very rare for a new artist, especially one who was so young. Taylor's songwriting process during this period was very personal. So she would write late at night after all the touring's done. And she'd draw inspiration from her diary entries. She'd draw inspiration from the events that happened that day. But she made sure there was a direct link between her life and her lyrics. And this would become a hallmark of her career, creating a sense of intimacy with her listeners that not many artists could match. But Taylor wasn't just content with musical success. In 2008, she launched her first line of sundresses at Walmart. Now, that might seem like a small move, but it was Taylor's first step into merchandise beyond typical business band tees. That's what everybody did at the time. So this sundress line, it included sundresses, it included summer wear, and it was designed to reflect Taylor's personal style and then appeal to her young female fan base. And this venture, it really signaled that Taylor understood her brand extended beyond music. And it wasn't just trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. She was positioning herself as a lifestyle brand for young women. And every single piece of merch, every single piece of clothing she created. She put herself into that thing. Now, by the end of 2008, Taylor had become the best-selling country artist of the year. Keep in mind, she's still incredibly young. Her second album, Fearless, debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 592,000 copies in the first week, which was a huge jump from her debut. Fearless went on to become the best-selling album of 2009, moving over 3.2 million copies that year alone. And as of 2024, it's been certified diamond by the RIAA, meaning that it's sold over 10 million units in the U.S. Now, Fearless represented a significant evolution in Taylor's sound and songwriting. While still rooted in country, the album started to incorporate some pop elements, and this helped broaden her appeal. So songs like Love Story and You Belong With Me became crossover hits, charting high on both country and pop charts. Love Story, with its Romeo and Juliet-inspired narrative and catchy chorus, became Taylor's first number one 
on the Billboard Pop Songs chart. Now, here's where we see Taylor's business acumen again. She wasn't just focused on album sales. She understood the power of touring. The Fearless Tour, which ran from April 2009 to June 2010, grossed over $63 million, playing to over 1.1 million fans. The tour visited five countries and featured elaborate set design, multiple costume changes, even this fairy tale castle set piece. Taylor's marketing strategy for Fearless was multifaceted and very innovative. She continued her strong social media presence, but she also started to embrace traditional media in new ways. For instance, she appeared as the musical guest on Saturday Night Live, not only performing, but also writing and starring in a musical monologue that showcased her humor and her self-awareness. Another savvy move was her partnership with brands that aligned with her image. So she became a spokesperson for CoverGirl, appealing to her younger female demographic. She also partnered with American Greetings to create a line of greeting cards featuring her lyrics, further monetizing her songwriting and expanding her brand reach. But perhaps one of the most pivotal moments of this era came at the 2009 MTV Video Music Awards when Kanye West interrupted Taylor's acceptance speech for Best Female Video. It could have been a career derailing moment. Instead, Taylor and her team turned it into a sympathy-generating, fame-boosting incident. The incident played out on live television, with West jumping on stage during Taylor's acceptance speech to declare that Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. And the moment went viral instantly, generating massive public sympathy for Taylor. She handled the situation with grace, refusing to speak ill of West in all these subsequent interviews, and instead she focused on her gratitude for the award and her fans. And the incident, it was initially shocking, it ended up significantly boosting Taylor's profile. It introduced her to a wider audience beyond country music fans and positioned her as a sympathetic figure. The controversy also allowed her to showcase her maturity and her professionalism, traits that would really serve her well. And the aftermath of the VMAs, Taylor's popularity soared. Fearless saw a 100% sales increase the week after the award show. She was invited to appear on numerous talk shows. It further increased her exposure. Even President Obama weighed in on the incident, calling West a quote-unquote jackass in an off-the-record comment that was later leaked. This ability to turn potential negative into positive was a hallmark of her career. She would later reference the incident in her music, most notably in her 2017 single, Look What You Made Me Do, showing her ability to control the narrative around her public persona. Now, by the end of 2009, Taylor had achieved more than most artists do in their entire careers. She had two multi-platinum albums, numerous awards, including her first Grammy for Best Female Country Vocal Performance, and a massive, devoted fan base. But more importantly, she established herself as a very savvy businesswoman who understood the power of authenticity, fan engagement, and brand building. Remember, in Taylor's world, every move is calculated. Every lyric is a potential headline. Every fan interaction is an opportunity to strengthen her empire. Her early career wasn't just about making music. It was about creating a sustainable, multifaceted business that would stand the test of time. Now, the year 2010 marked a crucial turning point. Coming off the massive success of Fearless, Taylor faced the classic artist's dilemma, how to grow without alienating her core fan base. Her solution was Speak Now. It was an album she wrote entirely by herself, a deliberate move to silence critics who questioned her songwriting abilities. Let's dive into the numbers. Speak Now debuted with 1,047,000 copies sold in its first week, making Taylor the first female artist to have multiple albums sell a million copies in a week. And the album went on to sell over 4.5 million copies in the U.S. alone. The Speak Now World Tour grossed $123.7 million across 110 shows in 19 countries. This demonstrated Taylor's growing international appeal. But the real story here is the strategic evolution of her songwriting. Songs like Dear John, reportedly about John Mayer, and Better Than Revenge showed a more mature and confrontational side of Taylor. So the media attention these supposed subject matters generated created a new narrative around Taylor's music. Each song became a puzzle for fans and media to solve, and it generated endless publicity. During this period, Taylor's business ventures expanded significantly. In 2011, she launched her first perfume, Wonderstruck, which generated over $50 million in sales its first year. She followed this with Wonderstruck, Enchanted in 2012, and Taylor by Taylor Swift in 2013. By 2014, her fragrance line had earned over $200 million in revenue. Now, the release of Red in 2012 marked her first significant step towards pop music. 
The album's lead single, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, became her first number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The album sold 1.21 million copies in its first week and went on to sell over 7 million copies worldwide. The Red Tour was another quantum leap forward, grossing 150.2 million and selling out major venues worldwide. A key innovation was the integration of corporate partnerships. So Taylor partnered with Keds, Papa John's Pizza, Target for exclusive merchandise and content. The Target exclusive version of Red included, for example, six additional tracks and sold over 400,000 copies in its first week. Now, let's also talk about Taylor's digital strategy during this period. She was one of the first major artists to effectively leverage Tumblr, using the platform to interact directly with fans and share behind-the-scenes content. This engagement helped create what became known as Swifties, one of the most dedicated and organized fan bases in pop music history. In 2014, Taylor made what many consider to be a risky move. She pulled her entire catalog from Spotify. She actually wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal about this, and she said, to quote, music is art, and art is important and rare. Important, rare things are valuable. Valuable things should be paid for. This stance on streaming revenues would later influence how other artists approached digital platforms. Apple Music even changed its policy on paying artists during its free trial period after Taylor published an open letter criticizing their initial policy. Then came 1989, Taylor's official pop album. The numbers here are staggering. First week sales, 1.287 million copies. Total worldwide sales, over 10 million copies. The singles, three Billboard Hot 100 number ones. Shake It Off, Blank Space, Bad Blood. The 1989 world tour grossed $250.7 million. But what's particularly interesting is how Taylor positioned this genre switch. Rather than gradually transitioning, she made a clean break, explicitly marketing 1989 as her first documented official pop album. This clarity helped avoid the market confusion that often happens when you have these crossover attempts. And the album's marketing campaign was just incredible. Taylor hosted 1989 Secret Sessions, which were private listening parties in her homes for select fans. These fans were chosen based on their social media activity, creating a powerful incentive for online engagement with her brand. Taylor's team also pioneered the singles as events strategy, so each music video released was treated as a major cultural moment. The Bad Blood video, featuring a roster of celebrity cameos, premiered at the Billboard Music Awards and generated 20.1 million views in the first 24 hours. So I want to break down some of the business implications of this era. Financial growth. Taylor's net worth increased from 45 million in 2010 to 200 million by 2014. Tour revenue grew from 63 million, fearless, to 250 million, 1989. Merchandise sales averaged $17 per attendee at concerts, and endorsement deals with Diet Coke, Keds, and CoverGirl totaled over $50 million. And the brand evolved too. So she successfully transitioned from country to pop without losing her core fan base. She maintained artistic credibility while increasing commercial success, and she built a reputation for business savvy alongside music talent, as well as establishing herself as a voice for artists' rights. By the end of 2014, Taylor Swift wasn't just a musician. She was a global brand. Her influence extended beyond music into fashion, business, and digital rights advocacy. But perhaps most importantly, she had proven that artistic evolution and commercial success weren't mutually exclusive. 2015 began with Taylor's 1989 world tour in full swing, but the real story was brewing behind the scenes. The music industry was rapidly shifting towards streaming, and Taylor's stance against Spotify put her at odds with prevailing trends. Yet, rather than simply reversing course, she orchestrated a masterful negotiation with Apple Music. The catalyst was Apple Music's announcement that they wouldn't pay artists during their three-month free trial period. Taylor published an open letter on Tumblr titled to Apple Love Taylor. And she wrote, quote, we don't ask you for free iPhones. Please don't ask us to provide you with our music for no compensation. Within 24 hours, Apple reversed its policy. And this wasn't just a victory for Taylor. It was a watershed moment for artists' rights. More importantly, it positioned Taylor as an industry leader rather than just a successful artist. So 2015, 
1989 World Tour. Let's look at some numbers. The 1989 World Tour ultimately grossed $250.7 million. Merchandise sales is creeping up. It averaged $20 per head, up from $17 on the previous tour. Taylor's music finally hit streaming services, generating an estimated $400,000 in its first week back on Spotify. And her catalog earned approximately $400 million in streaming revenue between 2015 in 2017. But 2016 brought probably the biggest challenge for Taylor's career, the Kanye West quote unquote famous incident and its aftermath. So when Kanye West released Famous with its controversial lyrics about Taylor, followed by Kim Kardashian's release of edited phone call snippets, Taylor's carefully cultivated image started to take a hit. So this was not good for her. The backlash was severe. So hashtag Taylor Swift is over party started to trend on Twitter. Her Instagram engagement dropped by 35%. Brand partnerships were put on hold and her public approval rating dropped from 75% to 55%. But she took it all in stride. She's very smart. She knows how to handle this. Rather than immediately responding or attempting damage control, she went dark. She deleted her social media posts. She avoided public appearances and she essentially disappeared from the public eye. Then came Reputation. This was her next album and the album's rollout was a masterclass in turning controversy into commerce. The lead single, Look What You Made Me Do, directly addressed the scandal while introducing a darker, edgier Taylor. The music video broke YouTube records. 43.2 million views in 24 hours, 200 million views in under a week, generating an estimated $400,000 in ad revenue alone. And the album's marketing strategy was revolutionary. No pre-release interviews, no streaming for the first three weeks, partnerships with UPS and Target for exclusive content, ticket sales through verified fan programs to combat scalpers. The numbers tell the story. First week sales, 1.216 million copies. Total sales, 4.5 million copies worldwide. The Reputation Stadium Tour grossed $345.7 million and merchandise sales hit $90 million during the tour. But perhaps the most impressive was Taylor's innovative approach to touring. So the Reputation Stadium Tour, it featured snake-themed marketing that reclaimed the emoji that people used against her. The average ticket price of $119, up from $86 on the 1989 tour. Partnership with Ticketmaster's Verified Fan Program and ultimately was a massive success. Let's break down some specific business innovations. For ticketing strategy, they implemented dynamic pricing. They used slow ticketing to combat scalpers. They created a tiered fan verification system, and they boosted VIP package sales by 25%. The merchandising side of the business and the tour. They introduced tour-specific collectibles. They launched exclusive digital content. They created location-specific merchandise, and they implemented pop-up shops in major cities. And for brand partnerships, AT&T sponsored exclusive behind-the-scenes content, UPS wrapped delivery trucks with album artwork, Target offered exclusive album versions, and Fujifilm created reputation-themed instant cameras. The social media strategy, like I mentioned, she wiped all social accounts clean before the album launch. She used Tumblr still to communicate with, directly with fans. She created private listening sessions for top fans, and then she launched the Swift Life app. The financial impact of all of this, her net worth grew to $320 million by 2017. Her tour revenue increased 38% from 1989. Merchandise revenue per head rose to $45 and brand partnership revenue exceeded $200 million. Now, the reputation era also saw Taylor take control of her business operations in new ways. So she launched Taylor Swift Productions. She created 13 Management for handling her business affairs. She established Taylor Swift Touring for concert operations, and she registered numerous trademarks for lyrics and phrases. By the end of 2017, Taylor had not only survived her biggest public relations crisis, but she emerged stronger than ever. She proved that in the modern music industry, controversy doesn't have to be career-ending. It can be career-defining if handled strategically. Now, November 2018. This was when Taylor announced her departure from Big Machine Records, her musical home for 12 years. She signed a groundbreaking deal with Universal Music Group's Republic Records that would fundamentally change how artists approached record deals. The key terms were revolutionary. Taylor would own all master recordings of her new music moving forward, and Universal agreed to share proceeds from the sale of Spotify shares with all their artists. And this wasn't just a good deal for Taylor. It was a paradigm shift for the entire industry. And in her own words, she said, Said, I'm ecstatic to announce that my musical home will be Republic Records and Universal Music Group. 
Over the years, Sir Lucian Grange and Monty Lippmann have been such incredible partners. It's so thrilling to me that they and the UMG team will be my label family moving forward. But the real drama hadn't happened yet. In June of 2019, Scooter Braun's Ithaca Holdings acquired Big Machine Records for $300 million. This included the masters to Taylor's first six albums. Taylor took Tumblr and called this her worst case scenario. She wrote this passionate post that laid out all the politics and the power dynamics about the music industry but what happened next was unprecedented. Rather than just accepting the loss of her masters, she announced that she would re-record her entire Big Machine catalog. This wasn't just about owning her work. This was a brilliant business strategy. It created new revenue streams from her old music. It devalued the original masters owned by Braun. It gave fans a reason to stream and buy her versions instead, and it allowed her to control licensing for commercials, movies, and TV shows. And while this battle was unfolding, Taylor released the album Lover in August of 2019. The album marked her first release under Republic Records and showcased a brighter, more optimistic sound than Reputation. And the numbers, wild. So first week sales, 867,000 copies. Total worldwide sales, over 3.2 million copies. Her lead single, Me, broke multiple YouTube records and her album spawned three Billboard Hot 100 Top 10 hits. And again, the marketing campaign for Lover demonstrated how Taylor evolved her approach to marketing and fan engagement. So she created this immersive, quote unquote, lover experience in partnership with Capital One. It included a pop-up shop in New York City, an exclusive merchandise collection, secret listening sessions in her homes again, and social media Easter egg campaigns that had fans decoding her posts for weeks. Then came 2020, COVID-19 pandemic. While most artists postponed releases and waited for touring to resume, Taylor saw an opportunity. In July, she surprise released Folklore, which was an alternative folk album created entirely during quarantine. And the move was brilliant for several reasons. First, it captured the zeitgeist perfectly. The introspective, storytelling nature of the album, it resonated with people stuck at home. Second, it showed her artistic versatility. It earned her some critical acclaim from some previously skeptical corners of the music press. Third, it proved that traditional album rollouts were necessary for success. Some of the numbers from Folklore, first week sales, 846,000 copies, streaming records, 80.6 million first day streams on Spotify, and it won Album of the Year at the Grammys, and it became the first album of 2020 to sell a million copies. But Taylor wasn't done. In December of 2020, she surprise released Evermore, a companion album to Folklore, and this one-two punch, again, unprecedented, but it worked because it maintained momentum during the pandemic. It gave fans something to look forward to during lockdown. It really strengthened her artistic credibility, and it proved her commercial success was independent on traditional promotion. During this period, she also began releasing her re-recorded albums. So Fearless, Taylor's version, arrived in April 2021, followed by Red, Taylor's version, in November. And the strategy behind these releases was incredible. Each re-recorded album included quote-unquote from the vault track, so previously unreleased songs from each era that gave fans a reason to buy and stream the new version. She also created new content around each release, like the all-too-well short film, which generated massive buzz and some critical acclaim. And the business implications of this era were enormous. Taylor could now control how her re-recorded music was used in media. Brands and films began exclusively using her versions. She could approve or deny synchronization licenses, and the value of her publishing catalog increased significantly. Some revenue streams that came from this, so multiple versions of each album, vinyl, CD, digital, exclusive merchandise for each release. She had partnership deals with Target and Walmart, and there was a whole bunch of, of course, digital content monetization as well. And I would say that this is when she shifted from pop star to serious artist, even though she was before, but she also maintained commercial success while gaining critical respect. She became an advocate for artists' rights. She built a reputation as a business innovator. And the Folklore Evermore era also saw Taylor innovate in terms of visual content and performance. So the Folklore Long Pond Studio Session film for Disney Plus showed how artists could create compelling content even during a pandemic. And the film grossed an estimated $7.2 million in its first weekend and demonstrated Taylor's ability to adapt to changing circumstances. And the creation of Folklore, again, Taylor just keeps innovating. It's really a fascinating study in remote collaboration and crisis adaptation. So when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, Taylor was originally originally planning a series of quote-unquote lover fest stadium shows, they would have grossed an estimated $200 million. Instead of waiting out the pandemic, she pivoted 
completely. Taylor reached out to Aaron Desner of The National, someone she'd never worked with before via email, and their collaboration process was entirely remote. To quote, it turned out he had been writing instrumental tracks to keep from absolutely going crazy during the pandemic, Taylor told Rolling Stone. He sends me this file of probably 30 instrumentals, and the first one I opened ended up being a song called Cardigan, and I just started singing into my phone. This process, again, this is not how, at the time, big artists do albums, right? So the production process was so simple. Taylor recorded vocals in a home studio she built called the Kitty Committee Studio. Desner produced from his Long Pond studio in Hudson Valley. Jack Antonoff contributed from his home studio in New York City. And the entire album was created without the collaborators ever actually meeting in person. And this surprise release strategy was equally innovative. Taylor announced Folklore just 16 hours before its release, completely bypassing the traditional months-long promotional cycle. This created some advantages to the release. So there was no leaks or speculation about the content. There was immediate media attention due to the surprise factor. Fan excitement was at a fever pitch when they released it, and there was no time for critical prejudgment of her genre shift. And the numbers, they tell the story. 80.6 million Spotify streams in the first day, and that was a record for a female artist with 16 hours notice. 846,000 copies sold in the first week. 2.3 million copies be sold globally by the end of 2020 and eight weeks at number one on the Billboard 200. But the real innovation was in the album's marketing and merchandise strategy. Taylor created eight distinct physical versions of folklore, each with unique cover art and photos. And this wasn't just about sales. It was about creating collectibles that fans would want to own even in a streaming era. And the merchandise collections were equally as strategic. So the folklore collection, cottage core aesthetic clothing. The In the Trees collection was forest themed items. The Running Like Water collection was music focused items. Each collection sold out within hours of release. Then this is where Evermore came in December 2020. And then the surprise release of a second album just five months after Folklore was again unprecedented for an artist of Taylor's stature. The strategy behind this release was different. So no physical copies were available at launch. Digital first strategy maximized to streaming numbers. Physical releases were staggered to maintain sales momentum and multiple vinyl variants were released over several months. And the approach resulted in 1 million global sales in the first week, number one debuts in multiple countries. She broke vinyl sales records months after release and she created sustained revenue rather than just a single sales spike. During this period, she also began her most ambitious project yet, the re-recording of her first six albums. And even the re-recording of her first six albums, the release of Fearless Taylor's version in April 2021 demonstrated the potential of this strategy. 291,000 album equivalent units in the first week sold number one on the Billboard 200. Multiple quote-unquote from the vault tracks hit Billboard Hot 100 and the streaming numbers actually outperformed the original versions. Now let's fast forward to 2022. So this is a period where Taylor starts to transcend traditional metrics of success to become arguably the most influential figure in entertainment and a legitimate economic force. So let's start with Midnight's. It was released in October of 2022. The album's rollout demonstrated Taylor's evolved marketing prowess. She announced it during her VMA's acceptance speech, then used TikTok's Midnight Mayhem with Me series to reveal track titles one by one. This strategy accomplished multiple goals. So it created sustained media attention over several weeks. It engaged with a younger demographic on their preferred platform. It generated tons of organic social media content and it built anticipation without revealing too much about the music and the numbers were unprecedented. 1.578 million units sold in the first week. She became the first artist to occupy all top 10 spots on the Billboard Hot 100. It broke Spotify's record for most streamed album in a single day, and it generated over $230 million in pure album sales. But the real story of this era begins with the announcement of the Eras Tour. The demand was so massive that it crashed Ticketmaster's system, leading to a congressional hearing about monopolistic practices in the ticketing industry. So let's break down the numbers. Eras Tour, 2.4 million tickets sold in a single day. Average recent sale price of $1,200. 20 million people attempted to buy tickets. Estimated gross revenue of $4.1 billion as of 2024. But the tour's impact extended far beyond ticket sales. The swift effect on local economies became a legitimate economic phenomenon. So in the Eras tour, this is what happens to a city. 
average two night stay in a city for the Eras Tour. $208 million in tourist spending, 95% hotel occupancy rates, 50% increase in restaurant revenue, and local business revenue spikes between 30% and 100%. And the Federal Reserve branches began citing SWIFT's tour in their economic reports. According to Bloomberg Economics, the Eras Tour contributed approximately $5.7 billion to U.S. GDP in 2023. So Taylor was no longer just an entertainer. She was, and still is, a one-woman stimulus package. And the tour's business innovations were just as impressive. So for their merchandising strategy, they had city-specific merchandise, multiple VIP package options, digital content integration, and then this whole friendship bracelet phenomenon that helped create community. And the friendship bracelet phenomenon actually deserves some special attention. It was inspired by a lyric from You're On Your Own Kid, and fans began trading homemade bracelets at shows. And this developed this incredible sense of community. It generated free marketing. It spawned this craft supply boom and it enhanced the concert experience at no cost to Taylor. Now, then came the Eras Tour film. So rather than partner with a streaming service or traditional studio, Taylor made a groundbreaking deal directly with AMC Theaters. The strategy was brilliant. Eliminate studio middlemen, maintain creative control, secure better revenue splits, and create another event for fans. And the numbers were insane. $92.8 million opening weekend, highest grossing concert film in North American history, $250 million a global box office, pre-sale tickets exceeded $100 million, and simultaneously Simultaneous to this, Taylor was releasing her re-recorded albums, Speak Now, Taylor's version, 1989, Taylor's version, both dropped in 2023, each becoming massive commercial and critical successes. The 1989 Taylor's version release was particularly impressive because it sold 1.653 million units in the first week. It broke her own record for biggest vinyl sales week. It generated over $400 million in revenue, and it outperformed the original version's first week sales. But perhaps the most significant development of this era in Taylor's life was her achievement of billionaire status. So according to Bloomberg analysis, she became a billionaire through music and touring alone, a first in the industry. So just to break down her wealth sources, music and touring, 500 million, music catalog value, 500 million, real estate portfolio, 150 million, streaming and publishing rights, 120 million annual revenue, merchandise sales estimated 90 million annually. By October of 2023, her net worth was estimated at $1.1 billion. By the end of the year, Time Magazine named her Person of the Year, acknowledging not just her cultural impact, but her role as an economic force. And the cultural impact of this area extended beyond music and economics. Her influence was felt in numerous spheres. So academic universities started to offer Taylor Swift courses. Economic papers studied the Swift effect. There was a cultural analysis of her impact and business school case studies. She had impacts on politics. So there was voter registration drives, congressional hearings on ticketing, economic policy discussions, and local government tourism strategies revolved around her. Then there was environmental impact, so conversations about private jet usage, carbon offset purchases, sustainability initiatives at concerts, and industry discussions about touring impact. The Eras Tour was unprecedented. The preparation for this tour began in late 2022, but its roots really go back further. Taylor and her team, before they actually did the tour, spent seven months planning and three months rehearsing what would become a three hour plus spectacle spanning her entire career. That's why I want to give it a little bit of extra attention just so you'd understand what is driving this massive economic surge and this revenue and this cultural shift that she's been able to accomplish. The show's structure was dividing her catalog into three distinct eras. It wasn't just artistically satisfying. It was a brilliant business strategy that allowed her to showcase her entire body of work while creating multiple merchandise opportunities for each era. The Ticketmaster sales disaster of November 2022 became a watershed moment for the live entertainment industry. When Ticketmaster's systems crashed under the weight of 14 million people trying to buy tickets simultaneously, it wasn't just a technical failure. It was a demonstration of Taylor's unprecedented drawing power. The subsequent congressional hearings revealed fascinating details about modern ticket sales. Ticketmaster had never seen demand exceed supply by 14x before, and their systems were stress-tested for only 3x normal demand. 
and the economic impact of the tour has been studied by economists, the Federal Reserve, business schools. When Taylor performed two nights in Seattle, the local economy saw a $40 million boost in tourist spending. Like I mentioned before, hotels reported 95% occupancy rates and average daily room rates jumped from $195 to $375. Local restaurants experienced revenue increases of up to 200% during show days, and even small businesses catering to Swifties saw dramatic upticks. Bead shops reported selling out of supplies for friendship bracelets months in advance. And the production values of the tour were unprecedented as well. Each show required 3,150 lighting fixtures, 38 semi-trucks of equipment, a crew of over 300 people, and 100 hours of setup time. But what's truly remarkable is how Taylor maximized revenue beyond ticket sales. The average concert goer spent $82 on merchandise, compared to an industry standard of $25 to $30. By creating era-specific merchandise and city-specific items, she drove collectors to purchase multiple multiple items, some fans reported spending over $1,000 on merchandise alone. And the tour's impact, again, it extended into these unexpected areas. When Taylor performed in Cincinnati, local bars named a specialty cocktail after one of her songs, Lazender Haze, and Karma is a Cocktail, and they became permanent menu fixtures due to the ongoing demand. In Chicago, architecture tours added stops at hotels where Taylor stayed, charging premium prices for quote-unquote swift enhanced experiences. The release of the Eras Tour concert film again, it showed her business acumen. She partnered directly with AMC and she secured an unprecedented 57% share of ticket sales revenue. Just to give you an idea, standard artist deals usually net around 27%. And the film's success actually forced Hollywood to reconsider its release strategies because multiple studios moved their their films to avoid competing with Taylor. And the Eras Tour to today continues to be a juggernaut, with the international leg promising even more unprecedented numbers. In Singapore alone, the government reportedly paid $12 million to secure exclusive regional rights for her show, a first-of-its-kind deal that sparked diplomatic tensions with other Southeast Asian nations. This represents a new frontier in touring, where cities and countries compete for exclusive performance rights. The merging of politics and pop culture reached new heights when Swift's potential impact on the 2024 presidential elections became a serious topic of discussion. When a single Instagram post from Swift led to 35,000 new voter registrations in one day, political strategy began analyzing her influence not just as celebrity endorsement, but as a legitimate political force. Time magazine noted that Swift's Instagram following of 270 million exceeds the U.S. voting population. Her business empire continues to evolve in fascinating ways. Recent trademark filings suggest that she's preparing to launch several new ventures. Documents show applications for everything from cookbooks to educational material, indicating a very strategic diversification beyond just music and entertainment. Her team has registered phrases like Taylor's version across multiple categories, protecting potential revenue streams in everything from mobile apps to kitchen accessories. The re-recording project enters its final phases with Reputation, Taylor's version, looming on the horizon, and some industry analysts predict that this could be her most commercially successful re-recording yet, given the original album's streaming popularity and the potential for updates production. What's very interesting, particularly interesting, is how Swift has used each re-release not just to reclaim her music, but to expand her artistic legacy. Consider how the release strategy has evolved. Each re-recording has become more elaborate, with 1989, Taylor's version featuring not just vault tracks, but also a comprehensive visual rollout that included partnerships with Google and Instagram and Spotify. These weren't just marketing deals. They were interactive experiences that engaged fans in new ways. And Swift's influence on the music industry just continued continues to grow. Following her lead, artists like Olivia Rodrigo, Sabrina Carpenter, they've begun incorporating Easter eggs and these elaborate rollout strategies into their releases. The quote-unquote Swift effect has fundamentally changed how artists approach album releases and fan engagement, and her impact on the touring industry has been equally revolutionary. Live Nation reported that other artists are now requesting quote-unquote Swift-style residencies in stadiums with multiple nights in major markets rather than single shows in more cities. The friendship bracelet phenomenon has also spawned imitators, with other artists encouraging similar fan traditions at their own shows. And the economic impact has grown 
beyond just concert revenues. Cities are now building swift tourism into their economic development plans. Las Vegas, for instance, is creating specific hotel packages and tourism campaigns around our 2024 dates, expecting visitors to extend their stays beyond just concert nights. Swift's ability to maintain cultural relevance while growing her commercial empire sets her apart from all these other pop culture phenomena. Unlike predecessors who peaked and faded, she continues to expand her influence. The Harvard Business Review recently published an analysis suggesting that Swift's business model actually represents a new paradigm in entertainment. One where artist authenticity and commercial success aren't just compatible, but mutually reinforcing. Looking ahead, several key developments are actually worth watching. So Swift's contract with Universal Music Group's Republic Records is reportedly up for renewal soon. Given her leverage and track record, industry insiders are expecting any new deal to set precedence for artist rights and revenue sharing. And there's speculation that she might launch her own label or distribution platform following the path blazed by artists like Jay-Z, but with potentially much greater reach. And if we look deeper into what's next for Taylor Swift, particularly examining several key developments that could not just reshape her empire, but the entertainment industry as a whole, the first one that I found was the emergence of a Swift-focused investment product that really just demonstrates her growing influence in all these unexpected sectors. In late 2023, the investment firm Direxion filed for a Taylor Swift-themed ETF. ETF, exchange traded fund that would track companies benefiting from her economic influence. So this includes Live Nation, major hotel chains, and retailers who see significant revenue spikes from Swift related activities. The fact that Wall Street is creating financial products around a single artist's economic impact is unprecedented. The international expansion of the Eras Tour presents fascinating new business opportunities. Take Japan, for example, where Swift's 2024 shows are driving what economists call revenge spending, pent up consumer demand following years of COVID restrictions. Japanese corporations are creating Swift themed products and experiences at a scale that dwarfs similar efforts in the U.S. Lawson convenience stores, for instance, developed exclusive Swift themed merchandise that generated over $50 million in pre-sales alone. The technology sector is another frontier where Swift's influence is growing. After her era's tour film successfully bypassed traditional Hollywood distribution channels, major tech companies began court her for direct partnerships. Amazon and Apple reportedly offered deals worth over $100 million for exclusive content and distribution rights. But what's more interesting is how Swift's team is approaching these opportunities, not just as content deals, but as potential technology partnerships. Consider the emerging AI landscape. Swift's management team has filed numerous patents related to AI and virtual reality experiences. One patent describes technology that would allow fans to experience concerts in virtual reality with personalized interactions. Another outlines a system for creating AI-powered character versions of Swift from different eras that fans could interact with through mobile devices. The education sector presents another opportunity. So following the success of university courses studying Swift's impact, her team is developing official educational curriculum materials. These aren't just music-focused. They span business, marketing, literature, economics. The University of Texas reported that their Swift Studies program received more applications than their traditional MBA program in 2024. Real estate, another key component of Swift's empire. Beyond her personal portfolio, valued at roughly a little bit over $150 million, she's began investing in commercial properties in cities where she performs regularly. In Nashville, she purchased a historic building that's being developed into a mixed-use space, including a museum, performance venue, an educational center dedicated to songwriting and music business education. The re-recording project's completion is also going to mark a very significant milestone, but it's clearly not the end game because industry insiders suggest Swift is developing what one executive called a quote-unquote legacy preservation strategy that goes far beyond music. And it could include things like a comprehensive digital archive of her work, including previously unreleased footage, recordings, and documents that could form the basis of future releases or educational resources, a foundation focused on artists' rights and music education funded partially by revenue from her re-recorded masters, a publishing company that would help other artists navigate the complex world of music rights and licensing. But outside Outside of all of this, what's the most interesting and maybe most intriguing is that she appears to be positioning herself for a larger role in the business world beyond entertainment. 
because her team has been quietly assembling a group of veteran executives from various industries. So this starts to suggest plans for a broader business venture. Recent trademark filings are hinting at a couple different moves. So it could be content production. So beyond music videos and concert films, there's some indication that Swift is developing scripted content and documentaries. In technology, there's some patents that suggest development of proprietary platforms for fan engagement and content distribution. For education, there's curriculum developments and educational technology focused on arts and business. And for retail, there's potential brick and mortar locations that would combine merchandise, experience, and education. And the future of her touring model is also evolving. The success of the Eras Tour has led to discussions about permanent residencies in major cities. Imagine Swift-themed venues in Las Vegas, Nashville, other key markets that would offer rotating shows from different eras, creating sort of year-round destination experiences rather than traditional tours. Her influence on the music industry just grows in all these unexpected ways. After her successful re-recording project, other artists started to explore similar strategies, but more importantly, new artists started negotiating contracts differently with what industry lawyers now call quote-unquote swift clauses, provisions that protect their rights to their master recordings from the start. And if we look at 2025 and beyond, there's several key developments that seem very likely to happen. Swift's next album cycle is most likely going to redefine how artists release music again. Her team has been studying direct-to-consumer models that could bypass traditional streaming platforms entirely. The completion of her re-recording project is likely going to coincide with the launch of a larger initiative around artists' rights and music ownership. Her business empire is probably going to expand into areas not traditionally associated with musicians, potentially including tech startups, education companies, some retail ventures, and the era's tour model will likely evolve into something more permanent with, like I mentioned before, these fixed locations. But the most significant development out of everything we talked about today might be Swift's evolution from artist to institution. She's creating a blueprint for how artists can maintain both creative integrity and commercial success while building lasting cultural impact. As one Harvard Business School professor noted, to quote him, Swift isn't just changing the music industry, she's creating an entirely new model for how artists can build and maintain cultural and economic influence. The Taylor Swift phenomenon offers a masterclass in business strategy, cultural influence, and the empire building that goes far beyond the conventional narratives of talent and hard work. What makes her story so fascinating is how she consistently redefines success metrics while creating entirely new paradigms for value creation. So just to dive into some of the lessons that emerged from her two-decade journey, the first one that I thought of was the power of long-term value creation. At the heart of her success lies an understanding of temporal value creation, long-term value creation. Unlike artists who optimize for these immediate gains, she has consistently demonstrated what I like to call strategic patience, the ability to forego short-term opportunities in favor of building long-term value. And it manifests in a few different ways. So the first way is temporal arbitrage in brand building because when she moved away from country to pop music, she didn't just switch genres. She orchestrated this carefully planned transition that took years to execute. It started with Red and she began to introduce pop elements while maintaining her country base, essentially creating a bridge between two very distinct markets. And this approach, I like to call it this value bridge construction, allowed her to maintain existing fan relationships while building new ones. And what's particularly interesting is how she managed this transition without the value destruction that you usually see with these kinds of major shifts when you switch markets or you cater to a new fan base. But she understood that authentic evolution isn't about this like dramatic reinvention. If you were, especially if you're a creator, if you're a business, she understood that authentic evolution is about making each change feel surprising, but inevitable. It's almost like you couldn't help but realize she was going there, but because she did it so gradually and carefully, you weren't upset. She had careful song selection and the release strategy during the transition period. Like each release pushed boundaries slightly further, but it still maintained this core element from the past that kept her base engaged. There's a lesson there for creators. If you are starting to branch out in a new direction, it doesn't have to be this radical shift. Second thing we can learn from Swift is the economics of emotional investment. So her approach to fan engagement was really quite sophisticated. She understood that by creating this multi-layered system where emotional investment from fans translates directly into commercial success, 
was needed, but she had to do it in a way that felt organic, not like she was exploiting her fans. And this is what she did right from the get-go when she was communicating with them, but also when she started to include the Easter egg in all of her content, right? So these little surprises that were these fun fan engagement tools, but were really just brilliant examples of what economists actually call rational addiction. So each piece of content consumed increases the utility and chance of future consumption. So when fans decode one reference, one Easter egg, they're more likely to engage with future content. This creates this self-reinforcing cycle of engagement that drives emotional investment, which then leads to commercial success. Now, this actual system she laid out and she set up operates on a few different levels. So if you want to set it up in your own business, there's three levels to creating this rational addiction to your brand or your content. The first is primary engagement, that direct artist to fan interaction through social media, music and performances. The second is secondary engagement. So this is fan to fan interaction. Remember, first one is artist to fan or creator to fan interaction. Second one is fan to fan interaction through theory sharing bracelet trading, community building, and then the tertiary, the third level of engagement is in cultural participation through memes, trends, and shared experiences. So to do this properly, you have to have proper primary engagement, secondary engagement, and tertiary engagement. Each level reinforces the others, and this creates a network effect. The value of participation increases as more people participate. But Swift's genius lies in how she monetizes these network effects without diminishing their authentic emotional value because other brands other creators try other artists try and do this but it feels like you are using your audience you are not you diminish the authentic emotional value you shouldn't but that's what most artists end up doing or creators end up doing so if you can look at what she's done and create wins across the board across primary secondary and tertiary engagement you create this flywheel that ends up in the quote-unquote rational addiction of your content, your business, your songs, your movies, whatever. The third thing she did very well was market, what I want to describe it as is market creation versus market participation. What does this mean? So this is probably the most advanced aspect of her strategy. What she did was she focused on market creation rather than market participation. If you are well-versed in business terms, this would be blue ocean versus red ocean. She created a market. Instead of competing within all these established paradigms, she created a new market. She created new paradigms where she can set the rules of engagement. So the re-recording of her albums, it shows, it illustrates this perfectly. Rather than simply competing in the existing market for her music, she created an entirely new market category, Taylor's versions. This move accomplished several things simultaneously. It accomplished value creation, value capture, value protection, and value enhancement. So value creation is it generated new revenue from existing assets. Value capture is it redirected streaming and licensing revenue. Value protection is it diminished the worth of her original masters that she no longer owned. And value enhancement, it added new content through vault tracks. But what's truly remarkable is she turned what could have been a purely business decision into this cultural movement. By framing the re-recordings as an artist's right to own their work, she created a narrative that transformed consumer behavior into moral support. So obviously she's done an incredible amount over her career and there's tons of strategy that's gone into it. I found that these are some of the most unique things that she's been able to do that I haven't really seen replicated by any creators, by business leaders, by artists, to a degree that she's been able to implement these strategies. It's just phenomenal what she's done. Now, when you look at Taylor Swift's sort of rise from country hopeful to global phenomenon, you have to be honest. This is more than just a success story. What with Taylor Swift is a complete reinvention of what's possible in the entertainment industry. With a current net worth of $1.6 billion, the highest grossing tour in history at $1.93 billion, an unprecedented cultural influence, she's created a blueprint for success that transcends the music industry. The story of Taylor Swift is, at its core, a masterclass in building sustainable success. From those early days performing at the Bluebird Cafe to becoming the first artist to gross over $1 billion from a single tour, she's consistently demonstrated that authentic connection and strategic thinking aren't mutually exclusive, they're mutually reinforcing. And what sets Swift apart isn't just her musical talent, 
or her business acumen, but her ability to create systems where artistic integrity, commercial success, and fan satisfaction all drive each other forward. She's shown that in today's interconnected world, the most powerful form of success is one that creates value for everyone involved, artists, fans, and the broader economy. The Swift effect has become more than just a cultural phenomenon. It's now a recognized economic force influencing everything from local economies to federal reserve reports. Cities compete for her concerts, not just for the immediate revenue, but for the lasting economic impact. Universities study her strategies, not just for their entertainment value, but for their implications for business economics and cultural studies. And perhaps more importantly, she's demonstrated that maintaining control over your work, building genuine connections with your fans, and taking the long view aren't just idealistic goals. They're practical strategies for building lasting success. Her approach to re-recording her masters wasn't just about reclaiming claiming her work. It was about redefining what's possible for artists in terms of controlling their creative and commercial destiny. And as we look to the future, it's pretty clear that her influence is going to extend far beyond music. She has created a new model. The true legacy of Taylor Swift may not be her record-breaking achievements or even her music catalog, but rather the way she's shown that in the modern economy, the most powerful form of success is one that creates value at every level, personal, commercial, and cultural. And as she continues to evolve and expand her empire, one thing is certain. She isn't just playing the game better than everyone else. She's rewriting the rules entirely. You have to understand that in an industry that is often criticized for its short-term thinking and exploitation of artists, Swift has proven that long-term value creation, authentic connection, and strategic innovation can coexist and even thrive. And as we've gone through this entire deep dive into her business and her life, perhaps the most important lesson is that true success isn't about choosing between art and commerce, between authenticity and strategy, or even between personal vision and commercial success. It's about finding ways to make all of these elements work together, creating something that's greater than the sum of its parts. That's the real story of Taylor Swift, and it's a story that's still being written.